2013 to my very first attempt at a video tutorial based on some of Keats's poetry. So far we've covered a wide range of his poems. We've had a look at his sonnets, including On the Sea, When I Have Fears That I May Cease To Be, Bright Star, Would I Were, Steadfast As Thou Art, and On Sitting Down To Read King Lear Once Again. We moved on to have a look at some of his narrative poetry. We had a look at The Eve of St Agnes, which was written in Spenserian stanza form. We then moved on to have a look at some of his odes. So far we've covered two. We've covered Ode to a Nightingale and also Ode on a Grecian Urn. What I thought we'd do today is have a quick look at one of his other types of poems. Okay, we're going to have a look at one of his ballads called La Belle Dame Sans Mercy. I'm hoping this is really useful for you, particularly because it's recorded, you'll be able to check back on this at any point, particularly just before exams, so that this is entirely fresh in your mind. I'm hoping you really enjoy this, I'm hoping this is worthwhile for you, and I'm really hoping you have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee to make this a little bit more bearable. Let's make a start! What I'd like to achieve today then is a deep understanding of La Belle Dame Sans Merci. We've not read the poem yet, we've not really dipped our toes into this poem at all, so we're hopefully going to understand that really well by the end of today. I'm hoping that we can do some really clear analysis of Keats's language and form. That will fulfil our AO2 section of the mark scheme. I'm hoping we can develop understanding of relevant contextual details. We know a lot about Keats's life, we know a lot about his literary context as well. I'm hoping we can use some of that because at the top end of that mark scheme are ways that we can use context to illuminate the text. As always, I've mentioned it quite a few times recently, the context is not as important as the text. The text must always come first. So even though in the mark scheme we are given 30 marks for our context and only 15 marks for the analysis of the actual poem itself, we must place the text first. Okay, exceptionally important. So as a result, what we should start off with is a reading of La Belle Dame, the Sans Merci. But what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard and so woe begone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose, fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. She looked at me as she did love, and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy's song. She found me roots of relish sweet, and honey wild, and manna dew. And sure in language strange, she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elvin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses for. And there she lulled me asleep, and there I dreamed, ah, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamt on the cold hill side. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, La Belle Dame sans mercy, thee hath in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam, with horror warning gaped wide. And I awoke and found me here, on the cold hill's side. And this is why I sojourn here, alone and palely loitering. Though the sedge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing. 
So before we start delving into the language analysis, I think it's really important that we have a quick look at the structure and the form. This is a different form to what we've seen before, so let's have a quick look and see what we can make of it. So this is the first stanza that we get presented with. If we're having a look at what rhymes with what, we can see quite clearly that the word arms and the word lake don't rhyme with any part of this poem. We do, however, have loitering and sing, which rhymes. Now this rhyme scheme continues all the way through the poem. The rhyme scheme is A, B, C, B. There are lots of different versions of ballads. Sometimes you have A, B, A, B. Sometimes you have A, A, B, B. What Keats has decided to do this time was use that A, B, C, B rhyme scheme all the way through. And it is sustained all the way through this particular ballad. Now you'll notice that each one of these stanzas has four lines only. This poem is written in quatrains. Now we can have a quick look at the rhythm. Lots of poetry is written in iambic rhythm, and that's exactly what we have in this poem. So we have an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable, and that pattern seems to continue all the way through. And if you have a quick look, if we read this first part, oh, what can ail the knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? You can see that we do have that iambic rhythm all the way through. Now, it's not iambic pentameter like we've looked at when we've looked at his sonnets. Um, iambic pentameter would need that perfect 10 in each line, 10 syllables, five iams in each line. But you will notice towards the end of the stanza, he breaks from the amount of syllables in that line. Now, all the way through, we have four iams per line in line one, two, and three. We have four iams, eight syllables in total. However, if you have a look at that final one where we don't have that, we have two iams, four syllables. And this is different all the way through the poem. Sometimes there are four syllables, sometimes there are five syllables. Keats seems to play around with the amount of syllables he uses for that final line. There's got to be an effect for this. He would have done this for a particular reason. Now, for me, when I read that final line, it's truncated. There's something missing. There's a sense of unfulfillment. And I think that's a deliberate thing that uh, Keats seems to be doing. And the question will be, why do you think that works particularly well for the content of this poem? So the ballad form was originally created for folk songs. It was a way of passing on a poem in an oral tradition. Now we've talked about this previously. I'm constantly telling you about how poetry wasn't meant to be read in, you know, in your bedroom when it's nice and quiet. It was supposed to be shouted. It was supposed to be spoken out in front of a large group of people. If you go back to where the Greeks had poetry, Homer would have been delivering this poem to a whole village full of people. And people would be sitting around the fire listening to this. Now, during the 1800s, this would be done in taverns, this would be done on, um, out in the streets. People would come and listen to some of these stories. Now, ballads were generally created to be narrative. They had a story to tell. And they were usually about some sort of tragic event that had happened worthy of being shared. Ballads were generally created in the Middle Ages, or at least that's when they appear. And what we see is a romantic poet trying to bring back this ballad form that had fallen out of uh, popularity. And this is something that not just Keats did. Uh, one of the most revered of all of the ballads is probably The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. We go back to a period before Enlightenment. We go back to a period before Industrial Revolution. Romantics seem to mine the past a time where magic was alive, a time where there were still things under, undiscovered. And what Keats tries to do is to tell this magical story using this magical form. In terms of structure, this narrative is cyclical. We begin with a knight at arms alone and palely loitering. He's next to a lake and this entirely desolate landscape seems to have very little growth, not very fertile, nothing seems to prosper. From there, he seems to discover a lady, this magical creature in the meadows. And he tries to capture her, he tries to make a garland, and he tries to adorn her. From there, she begins to bring him food. She nourishes and sustains him. And then she takes him to her magical grot, this place where she dwells. She lulls him asleep, and he is able to have these wonderful dreams. But from there, he wakes up 
alone once more, alone and palely loitering. We have a cyclical narrative, it begins and ends in the same place, but we do have an element of transformation that happens in between. The title of this poem, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, when translated from French, means the beautiful woman without mercy. La Belle Dame Sans Merci is also the name of a poem from the early 15th century. What Keats is doing is he is taking a poem from the past and he is reworking it. He's been inspired by something previously and changing it into something for a more modern audience. I think we've seen Keats do this on a number of occasions. The most obvious one being the Eve of St. Agnes. In the Eve of St. Agnes, he essentially takes the story of Romeo and Juliet and he adapts it and he reworks it into something new. He does this quite a lot. When he was inspired by Homer, he creates a poem explaining where his inspiration comes from. When he reads King Lear, he's inspired by Shakespeare to create something new. Even when looking at pieces of art like Ode and a Grecian Urn, he looks at a piece of art and he does something different with it. What we see is how one story can influence another, something that the Romantics used to do a lot of. The original La Belle Dame Sans Merci was believed to have been written in 1424 by a French poet called Alain Chatier. Now, the poem was about courtly love. It was composed of 100 stanzas of alternating dialogue between a male lover and the lady that he loves. The poem's first 24 stanzas describe a poet who is mourning. He is, he is described as a most unhappy lover. And he embarks alone on horseback, driven to wonder by sadness and stripped of his capacity to feel by death. After wandering for a time, the narrator poet finds himself obliged to attend a party with his two friends. It is at this party that the poet observes the unhappy lover, with whom he can empathise, and his lady. At the end of the 24th stanza, the narrator poet takes on the role of silent observer, hiding himself behind a trellis. He listens to, and then claims to transcribe, the conversation between the melancholic lover and the lady. The lover, in traditional love language, offers multiple reasons for the lady to accept him as her lover. The lady refuses to consent in witty and reasoned retorts. In the last four stanzas, the poet narrator takes over the narrative to give the moral of the poem. The experience of an idealised existence ending and causing an inability to feel can be seen in Keats's poem. After the knight at arms falls in love with the magical Beldam and is then rejected, he loiters in the real world, acknowledging its unsatisfactory nature compared to the ideal dream world he once inhabited. Now that we've looked at the form, the structure, and a little bit of context as to where this story actually comes from, we can start doing some actual language analysis, and this is where our understanding of the poem is really going to come into play. The poem begins with the word O. Oh. This reminds me quite heavily of when we looked at the Eve of St Agnes when it started with the exhalation Ah. The word O oh here for me suggests pain, it's an exhalation, it seems to be given a grandness, almost like this story took place a long time ago. And then we get the image of physical appearance. We've got him being in pain with the word ale, suggesting that this man is ill in some way, or his body is decaying somehow. And then we have the description of the person himself. So he's described as a knight at arms, and this gives connotations of strength and masculinity. If we imagine a knight at arms, we imagine someone who is defending themselves using armour, and they're protected. So we have an image of protection and manliness that seems to be subverted by the fact that he is emaciated in some way. His body is deteriorating. His state of mind is not particularly strong. The word alone tells us that this man seems to be lonely. It's an image of solitude. Knights are generally part of an army, and this man seems to be detached from the rest of humanity. The word palely, I would suggest, links to the word ale, because again it's an image of this man being ill. If you imagine his face being pale, he is devoid of colour. There's also a suggestion of deathliness, of ghostliness of this man. And then the final part of this particular line is loitering. 
The word loitering suggests that this man has no purpose in life, no direction. He's completely lost. He doesn't know where to go, which is the opposite of what we would imagine when we think of a knight. A knight should have a very clear mission, something to achieve. This man seems to be devoid entirely of any kind of direction in life. Those that first main sentence is a question. We don't know the answer to this yet. The rest of the ballad will reveal, perhaps, why this man seems to be so lost. In the next line, we have the word sedge. And you'll be completely forgiven for not knowing what sedge is. Sedge is a grass-like plant with triangular leaves. It typically grows in wet ground. It grows in temperate and cold regions. So it's a pretty hardy um, plant. Have a look at that picture, I've uh, put that in there for you as well so that you can imagine this. However, this sedge that grows everywhere is withering, it's withered. Even this hardy plant doesn't have an opportunity to prosper here. So what we've got is we've got this imagery of decay, this Im imagery of a gaunt figure who is really, really struggling. And even nature seems to be struggling here. Again, similar to how we saw at the start of the Eve of St. Agnes, when everything was damaged by the cold. We know that this takes place next to a lake, and we've looked at quite a lot of grandiose romantic imagery in the past. Now, this natural sublime imagery, we can imagine a very serene lake, but also from there it can be incredibly eerie. You can imagine some mist, you can imagine it uh, being incredibly quiet. And that's continued with the words, no birds sing. Now, birds generally symbolize growth and life and beauty. However, in this poem, we have no birds singing at all. They perhaps have nothing to sing about. They perhaps don't have the ability to sing because they are lacking something. And that obviously can be linked with this night of our night at arms. So no songs can be heard throughout this poem. This final part is monosyllabic in the way that it's spoken. And no birds sing. It sounds incredibly tragic. It sounds empty, like there's a sense of loss. And that truncated form, that truncated line that would normally have eight syllables and only has four, I think that only adds to the fact that something is missing from this poem, something has been taken away. This man doesn't have that one thing that he needs to possess in order to be healthy, in order to have something to live for. We see throughout this stanza, we see the deathly imagery, we see that damaging imagery, and we once again are placed into a position where nothing grows. In the second stanza, that imagery of illness seems to persist. This second stanza begins with exactly the same first line. Now, the technique itself is called anaphora. The same line is repeated to create that sense of magic, to create that sense of continuity. We then have the word so that is also repeated in that second line. And that adds emphasis on the emaciation of his physical body. It shows just how much this man seems to have lost, just how difficult his life seems to have become, and just how much suffering he seems to be experiencing. The first word to describe him is haggard in this case. And if someone is haggard, they are exhausted, they're weary. The way that they seem to look suggests an illness inside, perhaps a difficulty of the mind too. And when he uses the term woe begone, it shows that this man is full of melancholy. He's entirely immersed in grief and sorrow. He seems to be feeling unbearable pain. Then we have a slightly different image, which is the image that is quite natural of an animal, and that is a squirrel. Now, squirrels are famously industrious. They store food for the winter. They work hard during the summer. They make sure that they have plenty of food for the winter. And the squirrel has a full granary. So their stores are entirely full. They have plenty of food and they've worked hard to make sure that they can live throughout the, uh, the winter. And that seems to be in juxtaposition to this knight. This knight doesn't have anything to call upon. He's empty. He's void. He doesn't have that thing that he needs to sustain him through the difficult months that follow. With the imagery of the harvest is done, 
A harvest is, harvest is generally a time of prosperity, but in this case, that time of prosperity is over. If you look at one of his other poems called To Autumn, it's presented as a time where nature sustains everyone, that plenty of food exists on the, in, the, in, the, in the world so that nobody will go hungry. However, that is not the case in this particular poem. The harvest is normally an image of fertility and ripeness and sustenance. There is no more growth in this poem. There is no more creation. We now live in a place of emptiness in this poem. Now that we've started actually understanding the poem itself and we've discovered some of the images and some of the themes that are generated, we can start having a quick look at some of the biographical context. Like I said at the start of this video, we cannot just throw biographical context into an essay and hope that it does something. What we need to do is look at the text first and any opportunity to weave in some context, we take that opportunity to illuminate the text itself. So just like your essays, I'm going to make sure that throughout this video, I only put the context in when it's actually needed. This poem was written in April or May of 1819. 1819 was Keats's Annus Mirabilis, his miraculous year where he was able to create some of his best poetry. Keats died in 1821. It's really important to remember just how close to death Keats was at this stage. He wrote this not long after his brother Tom died of tuberculosis too, on the 1st of October 1818. So at this moment in his life, he was dying of tuberculosis. He knew exactly what the consequences would be. He watched his mother die. He's recently watched his brother die. And he himself is feeling the effects of tuberculosis, a terminal disease at that point. So it's going to colour the way that he wrote his poetry. And if we look at the imagery to describe the palely loitering uh, night darkness, we might actually look at some of that imagery and start thinking that this person could resemble Keats at this point. The feelings of being lost that we see in the poem can also be seen in Keats's life at the time. In January 1819, he moved to Chichester with Charles Brown. He then returned to Hampstead in February 1819. He considered abandoning poetry entirely on the 31st of May. He was going to either live in Tynemouth or become a ship's surgeon. He was ready to abandon his dreams to being a poet. He didn't feel like he was able to actually convert being a poet to actually having enough money to do uh, to live his life. We see this all the way throughout his life, that feeling of doubt, that feeling of um, that he wasn't good enough, particularly after some of the scathing reviews that he had. He abandons those ideas on the 9th of June and continues with his poetry writing. Keats struggled financially all the way through his life. When he was much younger, he should have received a large inheritance. However, that never made its way to him. As a result, his decision to be a poet instead of the apothecary that he trained to be could have been a cause of stress. He could have been worried that he'd made the wrong decision. He was desperately trying to create poetry. However, there were times in his life when he felt that this was incredibly difficult. Prior to this poem, he abandoned one of his enormous poems, one of his grand narrative poems called Hyperion. And that must have felt like a failure to him. He tried to create something and yet had to abandon it because he didn't have the creation, he didn't have the inspiration that he needed. Keats is famous for his fits of passionate creation, but also for his periods of inactivity. Modern day critics suggest that Keats would be someone who would suffer from bipolar, disease, bipolar disorder. He used to be able to create fantastic poetry with ease sometimes, and on other occasions would wander around lonely, not being able to create anything. If we look at the links between the palely loitering uh, Knight at Arms and Keats himself, we could hit a really rich, a rich vein of information that we might be able to take forward. In this next stanza, we see this imagery of flowers being used. The first one is a lily. I see a lily on thy brow. Lilies generally symbolise death. They're often present at funerals. They're beautiful and delicate flowers, but they are easily destroyed. They fade away. And that imagery of something fading away, the lily, this deathly imagery on this person's brow, symbolises that this person is descending towards death, or at least descending towards loss. We then look at the word 
anguish on the next line. And the anguish means severe mental or physical pain. And what we see is this knight at arms is agitated, completely devoid of relaxation. This is not someone who is calm. This is someone who is, who is severely in pain. If we then look at the word moist and fever dew, we get this imagery of something painful and something consumptive. If you suffered from tuberculosis, you would have periods of sweating, you would have um, profuse pain, and that imagery of decay can be seen in this poem with this particular person. On the next line, we've got this next image, which is again a flower. It says, and on my cheeks, a fading rose. The image of a rose is one of perfection. It's beautiful, it's red, it symbolizes life and passion and creation. However, in this case, with the modifier fading, it shows that this person is losing that color from their face, is losing that passion, and is stepping towards death rather than walking into life. The final line says, fast withereth too. The word withering we've seen already, but to wither means to decay. It's imagery of loss. There's no prosperity, nothing can grow, much like the sedge from the previous stanzas. And it's a deathly image. The, is, the rose is fading. This person's life is fading away, much like Keats's life was fading away at the time. In this next stanza, that melancholy seems to be punctured, and it's punctured by the word lady. So we've moved from someone who's alone and palely loitering to all of a sudden, not alone anymore, a lady has appeared. And this lady seems to remove some of his anguish. The word lady suggests grace and serenity and perfection. And this feminine person is able to drag uh, the knight or Keats out of this melancholy. And the place where he meets this person, I think, is quite important. It's the meads or the meds. That is a meadow, and we've looked at previously romantic bowers. This is a place where flowers grow wild, there's lots of fertility and there's lots of growth, and it seems to be that this breaks the inhospitable worlds that Keats presents at the start of this poem. So we have a woman who punctures this misery that he's feeling and drags him out of that melancholy and into a different state of mind. The description of this woman is what follows. First of all, she's described as full beautiful. So she's this image of feminine perfection. She's incredibly attractive, and this knight at arms looks at her as an image of perfection. Keats then uses a fairy's child, and he's deliberately used that archaic spelling of fairy. And that gives that this magical, ethereal quality, where this woman doesn't seem to quite be real. And we've looked at this type of imagery previously in the Eve of St. Agnes, where um, Madeline seems to operate somewhere in between reality and a dream world. And this woman seems to be something that's too good for this world. In a world of misery, in a world of pain, this image of perfection that turns up like a mirage is something that Keats is probably quite suspicious of. However, the description is her hair was long. Now, if this person has hair that is long, we've got that image of feminine perfection. You know, in the 1500s, 1600s, women would have long hair traditionally. But the fact that it's long suggests that it's untamed. And this is an image that's going to return and return throughout um, this poem. If her hair is long, it shows that she's wild, just like the wildness of the meadow. A meadow is a place of wild beauty. And this woman seems to be of that place. She seems to also be wild in the way that she's presented. The next part of the description is her foot was light. And that foot that is light suggests a delicate and graceful creature. And there's a suggestion here of magical uh, qualities. She seems to cause no damage at all in this place and brings this level of creativity that Keats was looking for. Her eyes were wild again shows how she is untamable. There's an exciting look in her eye which can also be perceived as a little bit dangerous too. But this creature seems to be magical. Now that we've come across the lady in this poem, 
I think it would be useful to mention how Keats had certain women in his life. Um, he had an affinity with a woman called Isabella Jones, and also, in the year previous to this poem, he'd come to a decision that he was going to marry Fanny Braun, and a, you know, a contract was signed between the two of them. However, I'm going to refrain from just making this about the biographical details of Keats's life and look at how this woman may actually be the personification of creativity or imagination instead. So if we talk a little bit about Keats and his views on imagination, I think that would be really fruitful. Keats valued imagination above all else. We've done a lot of work about romanticism and romantic poets felt like imagination and creativity are what will lead mankind to greater understanding, not necessarily the science and mathematics that those uh, thinkers of the Enlightenment would have suggested. His views on imagination were that truth and beauty could be accessed through the imagination. Keats believed that we could see beyond the real and mundane and perceive an ideal vision instead, one that allows the poet to transcend reality and see the divine. So through imagination, through a muse, through nature, we would be dragged away from the mundane lives that we all lead and be able to see the world in a much more magical and a much more religious way. Now, the relationship between dream and reality can be incredibly complicated. We've already looked at this in the Eve of St. Agnes, where Madeline seems to exist between reality and a dream world. We've also looked at this when Keats was musing on um, his viewpoint of the Nightingale, where he seemed at the end of the poem to be asking, should I wake or should I dream? He didn't quite know whether or not he was existing in the real world or in a magical world. On the one hand, the dream offers escape from the inadequacies of mortal, mortal existence, but its unobtainable permeance is also a source of disappointment. So Keats doesn't give us one answer. He doesn't just say that perfection can be achieved. He actually suggests that once we see perfection, that can then taint future viewpoints. So the removal of the ideal often leads to a sense of loss and knowledge of it taints reality as inadequate. So once you've seen something perfect, the knowledge that the next thing you see is not perfect can sometimes lead to a sense of loss. In some of Keats's poems, the imagination can be seen as dangerous as it tempts one away from reality in favour of an ideal that cannot be obtained. We saw this in Nightingale, didn't we? Now when we look at this woman, I personally would consider her the personification of creation. The pale knight at the start of this poem could be Keats, who is struggling for creativity, who is wandering around not being able to write the poetry that he knows he can, and he needs something to spark that imagination of his. So perhaps we should read this poem as a metaphorical quest for poetic inspiration. If you have a quick look at the words of Mario de Vanzo, the suggestion is that La Belle Dame Sans Merci describes perfectly the poet's semicircular arc of imaginative ascent, fulfilment, and decline into the world of reality. At the beginning of this poem, the knight at arms is palely loitering. It's lost in a world of inactivity, lost in a world with no inspiration. What then comes along is a moment of spark, something that creates uh, the ability to write. In this case, we have the magical lady that turns up. So we begin in a place of desolation, and through creativity, we're able to transcend. We're able to get to a place where we can create something beautiful. However, what is normally um, avoided and people don't think about is the descent that comes along afterwards. If we go up, we must come down. And Keats's thoughts on negative capability um, were incredibly important, and we can look at that later. So what we see is we see a poet who at the beginning cannot do anything, and we've now got to the point where that beginning of creation has happened. If we take that idea that this poem is about inspiration, then the word garland could reveal something a little deeper. Literally, it's a headpiece made of flowers. He's adorning her with nature. He's placing flowers in her hair. And the word bracelets tells us that he's wrapping flowers around her arms too. However, these two details share similar imagery, and it's imagery of restriction. It reminds us of an amulet or a manacle. Those are used to bind or to restrict. 
He's seeking to capture her, not literally, but in poetry. He's binding her, he's forcing her to comply, he's forcing her to conform. What he's trying to do is to seek to trap the magical in the real world. He wants to capture this level of inspiration and bring that into the real world through his poetry. And this can be continued in the next line, which is, she looked at me as she did love. So when he sees her and she's looking at him lovingly, he feels that sense of contentment because he's finally got what he's wanted. If you look at this stanza, it is in the entire juxtaposition to the way we looked at those first couple of stanzas where nothing was in the world, nothing was worthy of him writing about, and he didn't have that inspiration to capture anything. The final line, and made sweet moan, could be seen as an oxymoron. To feel a sweet moan could be that feeling of contentment. She's entirely happy. There might be an erotic element to it too. But also, the word moan could suggest some discomfort. What we have is a magical creature who has given inspiration to Keats, and he is seeking to capture that in his poetry. That image continues very strongly in the next stanza. The word set at the start of this particular stanza suggests that he places this woman on his horse. However, the word set has different meanings too. It could mean to regulate, to set a pace. Essentially what we see is that he's trying to capture her in his poetry. He's trying to capture the inspiration that she gives and bring it into the real world through his poetry. The word pacing steed continues that agitation. The word pacing means to move back and forth. It's a metaphor for his poetry. It's the rhythm, it's the metre, and what he's doing is he's capturing her and using that creativity to create a poem. This is a person who at the start was palely loitering, and now he has a horse, and that horse is moving back and forth. He seems to have a direction in life. When he says, and nothing else saw all day long, we've got that image of him being consumed by creation now. We spoke about how Keats seems to have those moments where he could, he could create and other moments where he felt desolate. Now he's very much enraptured by the creativity that has been given to him as a gift. When it says, for sidelong would she bend? We've got that image of her sitting next to him, uh, possibly sitting side because that's how women used to ride horses. But also this word bend might suggest that he has started to use her and she started to bend to his will. The word sing at the end of that third line is in juxtaposition to the way it was used at the start of this poem, and no birds sing. Now she has brought life into the world. She is now creating a world where birds sing, where she sings, where Keats can hear poetry. She's banished the silence for him. She's banished, banished all of the melancholy and the pain he was feeling. A fairy's song at the end of this stanza is magical. It's a song that's too serene for reality. Inspiration has allowed him to transcend, and this is something that we've seen in lots of different poetry. He captures a song so beautiful it could not have been created without her. What Keats is showing us is that when creativity strikes, he is able to create something absolutely beautiful. When creativity abandons him, he feels desolate and with no position. This next stanza begins with what she does. She found me roots of relish sweet. So at the start of this stanza, there's a subversion of the traditional gender roles. Traditionally, it is the man who sustains the woman. It is the man who goes into the world to collect food, to hunt, to gather. In this case, she is doing that. And she is sustaining him through a series of foods that she's able to procure. The first of those is roots, which is a natural product. She goes into the world and she finds products for him to be able to eat. The words relish sweet shows that she is feeding him. She's feeding him imagination. She's able to nourish his famished body and is able to reinvigorate him. She changes him from this palely loitering person and almost nurses him back to health with the food that she gives him. If we take this as a metaphor for feeding him, giving him creativity, giving him imagination, she is his muse, she is sustaining his body. She's giving him that thing that he didn't have at the start of this poem.
The next food is honey, and it's described as honey wild. Again, honey is a very natural product. There's nothing synthetic that she's teaching, that she's giving him. She is giving him natural products that allow him to transcend to a better place. Honey is also a product of cooperation. The bees rely on the nectar of the flower. Mankind needs that food from the bees. So that is cooperation. Keats needs something and this creature gives that thing to him. The final foodstuff is manna dew. Now manna was the food of the gods. So the inspiration, the food that she gives him, can be seen as a gift from the heavens. It's something too good for the earth and it's something that only God can give and this creature is able to give this gift to him. We then hear the next line which is, and sure in language strange. It seems to be that she speaks a different language, one that's not of this world, one that is different, it's other. So what we see is that poetic inspiration is at first difficult to comprehend, but he's able to decipher what she says, which is, I love thee true. And I love thee true shows that she's able to elevate him. She gives him that one thing that he didn't have at the start of this poem. He seems to have contentment. We seem to have a sense of euphoria at the end of this stanza. I love thee true. There's also a sense of danger here too, because he can't quite diagnose whether that's what she's saying, but she seems to be giving everything. I love thee is also a sign of contentment, a sign of being incredibly comfortable. And with comfort comes the loss of the need to create, and we'll cover that in a second. At the start of this eighth stanza, we see an assertive movement from one place to another. She is able to take him to a place where she exists, where the palely loitering knight at arms couldn't get to without her direction. We have that subversion of the gender roles. Once again, the female leading the man, not the man fighting his way through the world and leading her along with him. He seems to be able to transcend, to go to this magical place purely from her direction. And if we take this as the metaphor, as creativity allows him to create something beautiful, she is allowing him to move to a place of inspiration. The elven grot description shows this magical place that she dwells. It's a sanctuary of poetry and imagination. If you consider this imagery in juxtaposition to the imagery at the start of this, uh, this poem, we have the elements of emptiness compared to this element of fulfillment. We have the harsh coldness of the desolate lakeside compared to the warmth and magic that seems to exist in this elven grot. And there she wept and sighed full store. This is the first time we see the woman herself show emotions of sadness. And the emotions of sadness might foreshadow the fact that this woman cannot exist for a very long time, much like creativity cannot exist for a very long time. Giving that gift of inspiration is a momentary spark and it dwindles too soon. So the sighing full store shows that the fertile imagination must come to an end at some point. And Keats knows this. He is that poet who went through those fits of passionate writing and then feelings of emptiness too. And there I shut her wild, wild eyes. He seems to want to control her. He seems to want to be able to tell her what to do and when to do it. And that attempt is to regulate or to control. If we take that metaphor of him trying to regulate her into poetry, trying to capture that inspiration and record that through words, then what he is trying to do is to tame this magical creature, but she cannot be tamed. At the end of this poem, she starts to disappear. And that's because creativity doesn't have a place in the world. It's a momentary, mo a momentary um, piece of creativity that must disappear. With kisses four, he deliberately numbers the amount of kisses. And by numbering it, it shows just like poetry, it operates on numbers, whether that's syllables or rhymes. He's trying to capture this woman and he's trying to enclose her within the poem that he writes. So now that he has been led to a place he couldn't access before, I think it becomes incredibly important to look at the words that describe where they are at the moment. And he uses the word there. 
there is obviously completely the opposite to being here. We have a duality of place here, two different geographical places, one of desolation, one of inspiration. And there suggests an otherworldly place, an ethereal plane, where he is able to create and write and be successful in his career. She lulled me asleep. Now we have this image of she is in charge, not him. And she is able to soothe and comfort him. And that is in direct juxtaposition to the pain and suffering we saw at the start of the poem. We've moved from a person who is ailed or is haggard or woe-begone, and now we have her able to soothe those negative qualities. We've moved away from reality, which is painful, if you remember the quote, the fever and the fret, and now we're in a place that is perfection. But there is also an element of danger here. She seems to be lulling him. She seems to be tricking him into that calmness and that relaxation. And there she lulled me asleep. She makes him go to sleep, so he gets rest. He didn't have that rest at the beginning of this poem. We have that feeling of contentment or fulfilment. Once he's been able to create something beautiful, he then gets that feeling of achievement at the end. He's also able to escape into a dream world. And this is an image that we've seen quite a few times. We've seen this in the Eve of St. Agnes. We've seen this in um, uh, Ode to a Nightingale. And then we get the imagery of, and there I dreamed. So not only is he able to sleep, he's able to dream. And that place of imagination allows him to create. It allows him to see something different that he wasn't able to see before. We went from a place of reality and now to a place of dreaming. However, we then have this little pause and he then exhales, ah, woe betide. And what we see is that he begins to regret what happens from here. He's lamenting the fact that he will never go back to this place where he can dream, this place where he can um, see that level of uh, beauty. And the reason why is this, this is what causes him new anguish. He has experienced this image of perfection, this place that is too good to be true. And now any time he is not there and he returns to the here from earlier, it's going to seem substandard. It's going to feel like a loss. That knowledge of something better tarnishes reality later. And then he tells us that it's the latest dream I ever dreamt. And there's a suggestion here that there are no more dreams for him. This was the last time he was able to dream. And now he is unable to dream because he can no longer return to this place. The latest dream I ever dreamt on the cold hillside. And you'll see the reminder of the desolation of the previous stanzas. That repeated phrase shows that he once managed to escape that ill and desolate environment, and yet he's going to be forced to return there with the knowledge that there is something better out there. We are then told exactly what he sees in this magical dream that he's lulled into. We have the imagery at the start of this stanza of pale kings and princes. And that imagery of royalty normally conjures ideas of conquering or ruling or being incredibly strong and masculine. However, in this case, we've got the adjective pale used to describe them, suggesting that they're ill or sickly and they lost that control, lost that power that they once had. We also have the image of a pale warrior, death pale where they are, all. The reminder of the word pale is the reminder to show that these people have lost something. They have all gone through the same process that this knight at arms has. They have also felt the inspiration given by the Beldam, and they've all felt that feeling of loss as that is taken away from them. Now, if we look at kings and princes and pale warriors, we can look at these as other poets, other poets who have also had exactly the same process that Keats has had. The repeated word pale shows that illness and that their experience of the world has been marred in some way. And that feeling of loss may very well be that creativity that the Beldam gives. On the second last line, we then have the word cried being used to describe their voices. And this suggests that there is a suffering. 
these people can no longer create because what they need has now been taken from them. And it suggests that these poets are calling out to Keats, calling out to the pale knight and suggesting that he tries to escape their fate. And what they have to say is, la belle dame sans merci, the hath in thrall. The word belle means beautiful. So this creature has used her feminine beauty to ensnare him, to capture him, to give him something and then cruelly take it away from him. The word in thrall shows that she, he has become under her power. She seems to have captured him in the same way he sought to capture her. And she deceived him. She offered him something and then took it away. And that's the incredibly sad image of creativity. Once it's given to us, it doesn't remain for very long. It doesn't have a place in the world. It's like a gift that must be immediately given back. The bell dam that we see that lures this man into her lair gives him everything that he could possibly want and then lulls him asleep only to disappear later can be seen as what's known in English literature and in art as a femme fatale. Translated into an English, a femme fatale is a fatal woman. Someone who is mysterious and seductive and will use their feminine charm to ensnare their lover. They do this to lead men into compromising and dangerous positions so that they can achieve what they would like to achieve. They have a goal and they will do anything they can, including manipulating men, to achieve that goal. In early stories, they'd be seen as witches, people who can, have got powers beyond uh, the real world and are able to use that to seduce men and get them to act under their will. They're able to entrance and hypnotise people. She seems to fall under this particularly dangerous type of creature that promises everything only to abandon us once it's given. There are a lot of critics who suggest that the femme fatale that we see is very close to Circe, one of the minor gods in Greek mythology. She was the daughter of Helios and Percy, and we come across her firstly in Homer's The Odyssey. Now, on his trip back from the Trojan War, trying to get home to Penelope on the island of Ithaca, he comes across Circe on an island. And she uses her charm and she invites all of the soldiers to a feast um, in her lair. And what she does is she laces her food with a particular potion and it turns all of them into pigs. One of the crew members managed to escape this fate and told Odysseus what happened. And at first he would have had the same fate. However, he was able to protect himself using a particular spell with a particular herb. He managed to befriend Circe, who eventually allowed him to leave this island. She managed to keep him there for a full year. What she was able to do was to use her feminine charm, use her dangerous methods to get a man to act in exactly the way that she would like him to act. It's very similar to the way that La Belle Dame is able to ensnare her victims and then release them without that thing that they need. Keats continues to describe what the pale knight saw in these dreams that he was having. He says, I saw their starved lips. To starve means to not have food, to not have enough sustenance. And it seems to be that this Baldam has withdrawn that sustenance from all of those kings and princes and brave warriors. That lack of nourishment causes hunger, and that hunger will no longer be satiated in any way, because she will no longer give them what they desire. The word gloom is used, which here means dusk, that time at the end of the day when all sunlight has disappeared. So it suggests that there is no more light in this place that she has taken them to. That light that we may have seen has been extinguished and extinguished forever. The knowledge of the beauty makes the darkness more profound. And I think that's an incredibly important detail. The more you know what it's like to live in this place of creativity with light and warmth, the stronger that darkness and that coldness will be once it's eventually taken away.
we then get a description of how these pale kings and these poets are actually treated. And they are described as having a horrid warning and it gaped wide. And that's unpleasant. That shows that his contentment that he was feeling in this warm and interesting place is no longer there. He's no longer feeling that content. He's no longer able to dwell in those dreams. Now he's woken up very starkly, very quickly. And gaped wide shows the shocked nature of him waking up to something he wasn't expecting. He thought he'd be able to dwell in this place for a sustained period of time. However, he jars awake because it's impossible for him to exist in that place for any longer. And what we see then is a sense of profound loss. The dream is pierced and he seems to be dragged back to the unsatisfactory reality that he sought escape from. So he can no longer dwell with her. He now is shocked awake and has to deal with that place that he's come from. And when we say, and I awoke, it shows that he no longer can remain in the place of poetic inspiration. We've looked at the idea of dreams and reality many times before and what we have now is that moment of realisation that he can no longer live in that place that he was and that's compounded by the word here. We've just been using the word there to describe where he was, to describe that magical place. Now it's here and it shows a very clear distance between where he was and where he now is and he awakes to the same imagery we saw at the start of this poem. He is on the cold hills side. That is clear juxtaposition and it shows that that magic and that comfort and that level of inspiration that he felt in the Elven Grot is no longer accessible to him. The final stanza gives us the reason for him being pale and alone at the start of this poem. We've come full circle, it's cyclical in its structure. We find out why he was feeling like that all along. And the word sojourn suggests that he has to stay in this place temporarily. But there is a sense that this is a place he feels like he doesn't belong. He has knowledge of a better place, and yet now he seems to be trapped without that thing that he craves. And we use the word alone in contrast to the intimacy that he has knowledge of. He knows what it's like to feel that level of comfort. He knows what it's like to feel that level of creativity. And now he has to live with that knowledge and knowing that he will never at attain that again. And we have this image of palely loitering once again. So he's returned to illness. In previous stanzas, we saw the sustenance, the gift given by that woman. Now we see that he is going back to illness, perhaps being starved again, starved of the spark in order to create. And again, he's loitering, showing that without inspiration, he has no purpose and he has no direction. He's not, be, he's not able to create beautiful art. Instead, he simply has to suffer and he has to deal with the fact that he will no longer be able to create. He feels abandoned, he feels lost, and he feels without any sense of direction at all. We have the same image from the start of this poem, which is the sedge is withered from the lake. Again, this type of plant that normally is able to uh, live pretty much anywhere cannot exist in this level of coldness, in this level of uninspiration. And it shows that infertility. There's a loss of prosperity and in the elven grot where anything could be created, we no longer have that. This brings us to a return of and no birds sing. This brings us to a return of infertility where nothing can be created, a place that is inhospitable even to the most natural of creatures. If we look at birds as metaphors for poets, no poet can create in a world that is too painful, in a world that offers little hope. 
he needs to wait again for this inspiration to come around once more. After going through that, after reading it with you, the way I see this poem is a journey of creativity, a journey of creation and imagination. The poet goes from being unable to create anything, living in a desolate world, never believing that they'll ever be able to create again. And then from nowhere, a gift is given to them, the gift of creativity, a gift of epiphany. And they take that gift and do something with it. It sustains them, it seems to give them food, and it gets rid of that hunger and leaves them in contentment. And from there, we then see the descent from contentment back into despair, because once that gift is removed, they can no longer create in the way that they used to. So my views very much align with that of uh, Mario Davanzo. However, please don't think that this is the end of this poem. This poem is complete and that you know everything. Please go back, have a look, probe those language choices and find something in there that I haven't seen. There will be lots and lots of things in there for you to probe even further. This isn't the end of your analysis either, because I think it's always very good practice, even though this exam doesn't require you to use critical material in any way, but to read what other people have thought about this, people who know far more about this than I do. So if you have a look at the quotation that I've put on the screen, it says, in describing the end of a season, the withering of organic life and the end of a dream, Keats suggests that the imagination too has an inevitable and natural decline forcing the poet back to the fever, the palsy, and the fret of the real world. That inevitable process returns him not to the warm and blossoming meads of springtime, but to the flowerless, songless, cold and profitless world of late autumn. And if we link that to the context of Keats, I think that reading becomes very strong. This is somebody who, when they can create, they are prosperous, and when they can't, they descend into misery and they descend into emptiness and loneliness. However, if we just left it looking at one particular writer and their viewpoint uh, on this poem, we'd have quite a narrow viewpoint of what this poem may be about. Please don't just trust my opinions on the poem or one critic. Why not go to many people finding out where your thoughts, where your feelings about this poem seem to align themselves? So if we finish by having a look at David Perkins's view, whatever one makes of this dream, two things at least are reasonably certain. It breaks up the union of the lovers and the knight regrets it. Secondly, it has its pernicious effect by picturing the desolation which will come with the knight's return to actuality. Indeed, the warning might be no more than that man cannot hold visionary experiences for very long, and that when he awakes, he becomes starved for the lack of it. We've looked at lots of different poems by now, and this same idea seems to be popping up. Keats looks to a place of perfection and compares it to the reality that he feels. It links incredibly well to um, Ode to a Nightingale. What I would suggest is have a look at the two poems and consider how they reveal this idea that creativity is a momentary thing and that it cannot remain for very long. I really hope that you've enjoyed my tutorial on uh, La Belle Dame Sans Merci. I hope it gives you extra level of detail and I'm sure it will uh, help you to revise closer to the examinations too. I hope you've enjoyed the poem as well because ultimately that's why we're here. I think La Belle Dame Sans Merci is an outstanding poem. Uh, it's nice to look at one of his ballads instead of one of his other poems, so it's a bit of variety. Um, and also it's a poem about creativity, it's a poem about poetry and I'm hoping that's been really useful for you. I will see you next time. Thank you so much for listening. If you've made it to the end of this video, well done, congratulations.